Hello everyone, welcome to another video on the YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about Mono Red and Historic. This is a deck that in the past has been a pretty good choice for playing Historic as a budget option, but always kind of lack compared to the more powerful things going on in the format. Field of the Dead did a really good job of stopping this and had some incident of life gain, like things like Uro. And while Uro is still a big player in this format, I think Mono Red got some huge upgrades from Amonkhet that have actually allowed this deck to compete and actually be able to beat those Uro decks, thanks to a couple of incidental factors from that. So we're going to talk about Mono Red today. Mono Red is a deck that I have been playing actually a pretty good amount of recently. I wanted to kind of get some experience on it. I thought it'd be pretty good. I found a list similar to the one on screen here from an MTG Melee uh, tournament. They went 5-0. And what if we change a few things just to be a little bit more effective? And yeah, here we are. So that's what we've got going on for you today. So we'll kind of talk about this. And I'm going to start with the card that I think really ties it all together. Amonkhet has a lot of really strong, powerful red cards. But I think this first one here, Soul Scar Mage, is actually a huge addition for the deck. Soul Scar Mage is very unassuming, right? It's a one mana, one, two with prowess, human wizard. But I think being a one mana creature with a reasonable sized body that can attack and other things, especially if you can back it up with a burn spell to the face to kill a creature, along with being wizard is huge. Plus the incidental ability of if a source would deal damage, you put neg one, neg one counters randomly does come up. I have definitely beaten Uros by just wizard lightning the Uro. And then now suddenly that pressure isn't on me as hard and I've been able to close the door or kill the Uro in combat in a situation where normally I maybe couldn't have, you know, over the course of a couple of turns. So Soul Scar Mage, incredibly powerful card. Um, Turning on Wizard's Lightning also gives you this little bit of extra reach. Now we consistently turn on. We have 10 Wizard 1 drops, and we have a 2 drop as well. So really, turning Wizard's Lightning on has really opened this deck up. Wizard's Lightning plays a lot like Lightning Bolt uh, when you have this many Wizards, and we'll get to that in a bit. But uh, we have Soul Scar Mage as that. The other big addition we got recently, and this was from Jumpstart, was Grim Lava Mancer. Uh, Grim Lava Mancer gives you some more reach while also having a one mana play that will A, turn on the Wizard's Lightning like we talked about before, but B, you know, even if your Grim Lava Mancer just gets in for one or two damage via attacking and then shocks a creature of your opponent to clear the way or maybe shocks their face just for two before it dies, that's weirdly a lot of power from a one mana card. And it's turning our dead cards, which we have a little bit of dis-synergy with that and get Ru Lava Runner, but in order to get that two extra damage, actually turning our creatures... Uh, into burn spells later in the game where our dead burn spells into another burn spells is incredibly powerful and this is why you see cards like grim lava mancer uh see playing a lot of older formats especially before 2020 kind of magic where things creeped up but as a additional wizard to turn on our lightning and give us a bit, a bit of reach grim lava mancer is an all-star card so we're really happy to have two of this card in our deck and honestly if you have to draw a one drop later in the game if the get rue haste isn't going to kill them lava mancer threatens to be get rue that gets through blockers which i think is very relevant actually we have get Ru lava runner as our last one drop get Ru lava runner pretty classic card just another wizard it turns into a 2-2 pretty easily in this deck it's pretty strong we have four shocks we have a lot of burn spells i guess i'll cover those really quick i'm gonna talk about the creatures because i think we mentioned wizard's lightning a bunch now so it's important to talk about this card it's just two less if you control wizard which playing it as lightning bolt is actually really strong there's been a lot of discussion on is bolt too strong for historic um, it, it would originally was going to be in Jumpstart and then got removed as one of the 20 cards. And what I've seen with playing Wizards Lightning is it actually might be uh, currently maybe net good for the format, but it'd be very strong still. So Wizards Lightning plays like Lightning Bolt a lot of the time. And if I had actual Lightning Bolt instead of Shock, I feel like this deck would be really, really strong. And obviously things change because other decks get to play Bolt for our creatures. But wow, Wizards Lightning has just overperformed and I'm so happy to have this card in my deck. Lots of games where, you know, you kind of curve out and then like Creature plus Wizards Lightning, they're like turn three play and that's sort of a huge tempo swing and you hit them for a bunch or maybe off the top you just bolt them, you know, and you need that little bit of mana efficiency thanks to Frenzy. So Wizards Lightning, great to have. Lightning Strike is the three of. Just need to be able to bolt them down. You need to be able to clear the way for creatures. So it's nice to have a little bit of reach in those cards. We have Vashina Pyromancer, which is a two drop wizard, does two to the face or a Planeswalker. A lot of times just a shock and turning on with its lightning. It's very nice. It's it's nice to have a creature that also doubles as like, you know, a, a shock basically in the deck. And having that sort of extra reach on your card is really nice and also makes it so that your creature's resolving, even if they get answered by, you know, extinction event or a Wrath of God or something like that, they still got a little bit of value in. And having that in your two drop is so nice and is so helpful with cards like Experimental Frenzy. And we are an Experimental Frenzy version of the deck, you know. We've shown you all these aggressive early one drops. They make our spells cheaper. It's really easy to play a bunch of spells off the top of your deck, and we want to make sure we're doing that. The deck plays three Goblin Chain Whirlers, the card that Minute standard for a long time. I actually have the fourth Chain Whirl on the board, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. But 
basically Goblin Chain Whirler is a great threat. Um, I think sometimes the deal one isn't super great right now in Historic, so I just have three in the main deck and one in the board uh, for the matchups where I really want it. But still a great body, still applies a lot of pressure, and does that incidental one damage that we talked about before, having incidental damage on our creatures so that even if they get Wrath, while obviously not great to do three mana, three mana to do one damage, like it's not not what you want, right? It's just it's absurd. I would never play that card. But the fact that sometimes it completely and utterly dominates the battlefield as a three three first strike, and the times where they don't kill it, it's now a repeatable bolt. Creatures are so strong. Goblin Chain World is one of the best red creatures we've had in a long time. Rampaging for us on also holds that cake of one of the best red creatures we've had in a long time. It doesn't get talked about as much for a couple of reasons. One of them being the card was actually banned for a portion of its standard life up until the very end. So Rampaging for us on I think doesn't get the disrespect it deserves, but this is an all-star red creature. When Goblin Chain World's effect isn't as great, Rampaging for us on has a bunch of different modes, and I think its other effect is very nice of players can't gain life. So really what Rampaging Frost on does is it allows us to have a play on curve that punishes Uro players, right? If Uro players have some worse mana and they're trying to set up for a turn three Uro, trying to stabilize a little bit, but maybe have an Uro on board and they're trying to stabilize attack us, this card allows them to, yeah, they're going to get to draw some cards and sure they're hitting you with a 6-6, six, six, but not gaining three life. Three life is a card, right? All of our cards at most do three damage outside of Frenzy, uh, or I guess I should say around three damage, not maybe at most. Um, but Rampaging for us on undoes that, which normally undoes our draw. And its little ping effect is actually sort of helpful in some other matchups. So I found Rampaging for us on to actually just be an all-star card right now in this format. All, of, all the decks that exist, Rampaging for us on is one of the more powerful ones. Uh, and yeah, I, I just think this card is actually great, and that's why I have the full four in the main deck. There are some matchups where you do trim this card, but for the most part, Rampaging for us on is a good solid creature that is going to get through a lot of damage light up the stage another one of our draw spells one of the interesting things about red in the recent years is they've gotten this conditional card draw and light up the stage is one of the best examples of that just getting to move through your deck for two more cards is so efficient for a mana sure sometimes you do have to pay three mana but it's basically divination at three mana and you know while not a card that's seen play in center a long time it's something that you have considered in the past, and when it's one man divination, it's so good, so efficient, and helps us find our cards like Experimental Frenzy that turn into these unstoppable engines. So I love having Lab Stage in this deck. For Experimental Frenzy, we are an Experimental Frenzy deck. One of the interesting things is, because of the way our deck is constructed, and I think uh, Historic as a format, I don't have all four Experimental Frenzies in the main deck. I have three in the main and one in the board for the matchups where we really want the Frenzy. But I think why at this stage, just a nice-ish Experimental Frenzy thing, and we don't want to get too many of these clogged up in our hand in certain matchups where speed matters. So, Frenzy, completely an utter crazy card. It is wild to me that this card does not see more play in standard. I get that the creatures in the red card in standard are lacking in power, and there are other ways to build them. You know, Embercleave is another incredibly strong card, but if you look at this card and you first saw it and you first played against it like, two years ago like I did, you would have thought this card's going to see play for its whole life in standard, and you would have been wrong, and it's wild that we actually live in that world, but luckily in Historic, we actually get to abuse this card to its fullest power, and it is strong i promise you uh and then when it comes to lands we have Ram ramen up ruins uh this is one of the new additions from ramen kit as well just actually being a mountain quote unquote that becomes a shock in the late game i think is super important it, your deck sometimes just floods out and now you have four four lands that you can draw that just shock your opponent and how many times is mono red with or against have you played where you win on like where they win on just a couple of life points ramen up ruins really helps solve that problem. And with Experimental Frenzy, you move through your deck so much, you want to hit these land drops, you're going to find these Ramanop Ruins. The only thing that stops Frenzy is lands, and bam, Ramanop Ruins is there to help fix that problem. 16 Mountains for good mana base here. Also, got to use Rebecca Gway. Got to. And then uh, Castle Embreath. We have a lot of little creatures that we can curve out on. So we have one Castle Embreath. It's between this or a Sunscorched Desert. I've opted that for right now, the matchups where I have... My Sun Scorch Desert coming in, I'm normally trimming a Goblin Chain Whirler, so it's not a huge problem. But yeah, I just basically didn't want to have any lands that could let me not cast Goblin Chain Whirler on three. Because the matchup where you wanted on three, you really, really wanted on three. At this point in the video, we're going to have our classic sideboard guide popping up on screen here. So you're going to see that, but let's keep talking about the cards on our sideboard here. It's pretty simple for a lot of this stuff, so I'm just going to kind of talk about the little bit of a weirder things. And then I'll knock out all these removal spells we have here. So we have one Sunscorched Desert. Uh, this is actually to bring in as additional land because we're going to bring in Experimental Frenzy and Hazoret. And 
most of the time bone crusher giant kind of as a package against some of these bigger go longer decks and i want that extra land you know we have 21 lands in the main deck i want to be hitting my lands and curving out and just popping off with all my cards so having 22 lands i think is nice for that reason and sunscorch desert it's kind of turns into you know a bolt basically right like if you have a ramen up ruins in a sunscorch desert it does three damage which is kind of nice against those grindier decks also turns on our spectacle which is super helpful Hazaret is this incredibly powerful late game engine card uh it just it has this ability to completely and utterly take over the game it's so hard to kill it's hard to interact with it turns every card you draw into a, a shock which is weirdly powerful and it also gives us the potential just to go like one drop, two drop, three drop, Hazard, kill you. And you just have these unbeatable draws. And the format has Extinction Event as a pretty big player right now, but also has Wrath of God as a big player. And sometimes your opponent just can't effectively answer this. Or maybe you went like one drop, one drop, you know, spell, three drop, Hazard, And then now suddenly we have a really weird lineup of CMCs for our opponent's Extinction Event. And what are they going to do? Not take Hazard? They probably have to take Hazard out. How are they going to kill anything else? How are they going to kill that card without another Extinction Event? It's very powerful. Hazard is another powerful late game card against these go gr long grindy decks. Uh, and I love having Hazard for that reason. Experimental Frenzy, very much similar to Hazard, the same sort of decks where we want to go long. We want to be able to outgrind our opponents. Experimental Frenzy, all star card. Goblin Chain Whirler in the sideboard as the one of. Like I said, I think it isn't the best time in the world for Goblin Chain Whirler. The Rakdos Pyromancer deck has really ticked up in popularity, and we love to see that here on the channel. But. I still think that the other matchups aren't super great for Goblin Chain Whirler, and I think Citadel decks are moving away from the all-in elves builds at the moment, and with that being the case, I think Chain Whirler just deserves to be in the sideboard, and I'd much rather have Frosted on. And most of those matchups I just mentioned, you'd much actually rather have Frosted on deal damage, just as a way to get incidental damage, and also turn off the life gain for all those decks. Those decks have Blood Artist, they have Lurus, they have ways to uh, cling to dust, they have just ways to gain life that can be quite annoying, and having that and you can no, no, no gain life, super powerful. Bonecrusher Giant is a flexible burn spell and creature. And what I like about Bonecrusher Giant in our deck is it helps us curve out uh, against the sort of decks I mentioned earlier, like the bigger controlling ones where we just want to be like using our mana, playing our spells, playing these big haymakers. And Bonecrusher Giant's a big body that our opponent respects, has to respect. But also the cool thing about Bonecrusher Giant is that in creature-based matchups, like maybe Mono Green, for example, or the Mirror, Bonecrusher Giant plays as a two-for-one almost all the time. And so Bonecrusher Giant is a flexible sort of threat answer spell on our sideboard that we can have in these other matchups to be a bigger threat and have some reach and damage can't be prevented is weirdly relevant sometimes. Uh, and then other times, it's just like, kill your elf, play this thing as a 4-3, trade with your questing beast, and that's all you need in some worlds. Lava Coil is some of our start of random removal spells, quote-unquote random, that we have. We have a suite of them just to try and line up against things that are causing us problems. Lava Coil, great against those Rakdos decks, great against the kind of bigger green decks that are popping around here and there, great against the uh, Sacrifice-type decks, uh, like the specific like, Cat Oven, like Mayhem Devil. We see a little bit of that floating around these days. And Lava Coil, great against those sort of decks. If you snag them, it's awesome. Lava Coil... Not the most efficient thing in the world. It's kind of weird at times with our plan, but sometimes you just need to be able to answer a creature that would normally be a problem. And worth mentioning, too, that Lava Coil uh, with Soulscar Mage and the Burn Mirrors is actually a way to answer the opponent Tazarets and things of that nature because the Soulscar Mage will put minus one, minus one counters and it gets run indestructible. So just think about that sort of things when you're playing the Mirror. Same thing with Red Cap Melee. We have Fry. There's just a lot of blue and white things that are really hardcore need to answer. Like Teferi, I find to be quite annoying as a thing to kill. Um, Gideon of the Trials has seen a little bit of play recently. So Fry, just a nice little one of. It's also good against, you know, like those mono blue tempo decks you'll see every now and again. It's nice just to have a card like this that you can bring in. And sometimes you're going to play against people and just be like, oh, they have like a couple pretty good blue and white creatures. Blue or white, sorry about that. And you just fry them. So... I, I think it's nice just to have a fry. I can see these like spells here, like Lava Coil, Fry, a Braid, Red Cat, Melee. Numbers getting switched a lot. And I think if you really want to be on top of Mono Red, and specifically this build of Mono Red, this part of your sideboard needs to be moving a lot. Maybe even your in game packages as well. Maybe Glory Bringers, I think, you need to look towards at some points. But this sort of thing here, expect this to be very fluid. And if you're watching this video and you really want to get something out of it more than just a sideboard guide on your screen, then Fry might be a great thing to look at. I was like, hey, is this something that I really want to be playing right now? Do I want to up the numbers? I need to decrease them. 
And for right now, I like having a fry, but maybe that's going to change here in a couple weeks. Or maybe even in a couple days, sometimes things change very, very quickly. So always be on top of that when it comes to the sideboard. Don't just be like, I have to play fry. Mason had fry. A braid is our next card in our sideboard. Very versatile. It's another super strong Amonkhet card. Being able to answer artifacts, I have found to be quite good. The mono green uh, ramp artifact deck has been taking up a little bit. So basically, they like try to stick a bunch of planeswalkers like Karn the Great Creator, Vivian, Nissa, and a braid kills basically everything in that deck except Elgar Gargaroth. And it teams up with a chain whirler or another bolt spell to take down Gargaroth. And that deck has a bunch of artifacts that sometimes cause problems, including some artifact creatures like Platinum Angel that they try to play as a way to like instantly gain life and race you, you know, and be like, okay, I'm at 10, and now I have this Platinum Angel, so your board doesn't matter, so you have to have double kill spell, but a braid actually lets you A, answer the early elves so they don't get underneath you, and then B, answer those late game cards that can be a problem. A braid's also great in the mirror match. Um, I like to play the more controlling role in the mirror, so that's why you're going to see, like, Bone Crusher Giant, Frenzy, Red Cat Melees, a braid's come in, and then now with a braid, if people are playing the Embercleave version of Mono Red, which I think is the other playable version of Mono Red right now, a braid's like bang destroy your ember cleave for two mana or bang blow up your three drop play nice chain whirler nice annex nice bone crusher giant and you get that efficient tempo answer so braid another all-star on the sideboard and the last one's red cat melee just gonna say this it's obviously a mono red hate card but there are some matchups and sometimes where i actually bring red cat melee in including i played against Oris once and i was like i actually just want a red cat melee i just want to blow up a spirit dancer and i will lose a land to do it and I, I think that's a thing that you need to think about. Like, hey, is it okay to lose a land in these sort of matchups? Do I need to answer this creature early above all else? And we have a lot of different tools, but sometimes that will pop up and Historic's a deep format. So I would just say, hey, obviously bring this in against red decks and hey, maybe they got 4X, power cre 4x toughness creatures, kill them. Have a great time. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you haven't already, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and then if you want to get notifications, you can ring that little bell, bell, bell. I try to upload two videos a week. I didn't get to do that last week because of the unfortunate pre-announcement of a historic ban, but luckily, Field of the Dead left the format, so that was a little bit of a good side. I'm going to try and do a deck tech uh, on Citadel soon, but maybe I want to do a gameplay thing. I'm still trying to figure out how I want all this stuff to go, so make sure to leave feedback. I've gotten a lot of great feedback so far, and I love it, so until next time. Have a great one.